Hello and welcome to Finding Focus, uh, conversations on photography in Scotland. This is a new podcast made by me, Christina Webber. Uh, I am a visual artist based in Edinburgh. I've lived here for almost 10 years now. Um, and this essentially aims to be a really informal chat between me and, and a handful of photographers that I admire, talking a bit about how they kind of found their way into the photography industry and uh, on a particular project that I have asked them to, to talk about. This is definitely an experiment at this stage and uh, due to the current situation I have, do not have access to some of the equipment that I would like uh, as we're all in lockdown but I thought it would be a good opportunity to just get the first few out there anyway um, as I think people could use a, a pint and a chat right now so uh, please let me know what you think. All feedback is welcome. I really want to make these better and continue to improve so uh, yeah, any support or advice would be great. In today's episode, I am talking to Dave Ferry. Dave is a photographer based in Edinburgh. He recently exhibited in the Street Level Open, which is a group exhibition at Street Level Photoworks in Glasgow. And this year, he recently self-published his book, The River Isn't Yellow in Winter. You can stalk Dave online at daveferry.com where you can find his Instagram details, his Facebook, his email, and even his mobile phone number. Thank you so much. Please enjoy. This is Finding Focus. I'm gonna just start good. Um, welcome, Dave. Hello, everybody. Hello. Um, I think it's always nice to start with an icebreaker. <laughs> so <laughs> if you wouldn't mind just giving yourself, giving the people listening a really brief introduction to you, that would be fantastic. Okay. Me in general or me as a photographer? Mm, both. Okay. Um, I'm Dave Ferry from, well, I guess I'm from Glasgow originally in Scotland, but I moved to the borders. Well, this is a terrible introduction. Moved to the, <laughs> a wee place called Bickerhood uh, in the Scottish countryside when I was a youngster. Spent my formative years there until going back to Glasgow for college and uni university, where I learned about the magical world of photography. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you make it sound so stiff, <laughs> and like I've given you lines to say. Uh, what did you study in Glasgow? I studied multimedia technology. And what is that to it's, the lay person? No one really knows, to be honest. It was uh, a mishmash of coding, web design, graphic design, video work, and uh, one class, literally one class in four years of photography. Uh, the course, I mean, when I started at college I was 17, so I really didn't know what the fuck I wanted to do with my life. And the course, it seemed like the course was full of people much like that. No one really knew what the course was about or what they wanted to do. And the course leaders didn't really know what the course was about either, so we just kind of did a bunch of computer shit and had some fun. Uh, it was, wasn't the worst. I mean, it was a good time in my life because, you know, I moved to Glasgow and getting steaming and meeting some pals. <laughs> but the actual course was, yeah, I didn't really care for it that much. But Looking back, do you think it was a good decision to go straight into further education? Uh, yes. But only because I left I left high school a year early because I didn't enjoy it anymore. And I'm just really bad at studying, to be honest. So when things started to get hard, I just quit. <laughs> Rather than stick it out and try hard, I just left high school uh, and went to college. And I mean, yeah, I don't know that it was the best course for me, but the people I met and the experience that I had, I wouldn't change. Uh, but about halfway through the course, I did start getting into photography more, and people were saying to me why I didn't like leave the course and study photography instead. But I guess in some ways I'm quite happy I didn't go to art school or whatever, because I feel that not that I think art going to art school or whatever is a bad thing, but I feel studying photography shapes you in a way that I wouldn't have. Come to them on my own, 
I guess. No, it doesn't really make sense. I mean, I came to photography on my own terms rather than yeah. being told what it was about, I guess. Right. <laughs> yeah, which I, I think it probably took me a lot longer to get to where I am now than it would have done if I went to art school or whatever, but I'm reasonably happy with how the journey has been so far. So. And I think going to art school is one very distinct it's a very certain route you know, it's a very distinct way of which you're going to actually learn photography and be taught photography and you'll see it very much through an art school lens yeah, yeah. Um, which is not for everyone you know? yeah I feel like art school teaches you how to think cr critically about the work and produce theory and that's not the right word produce like Waffle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you want to call it that, you know. Uh, whereas, Convincing like, waffle. Napier or a place like this, or even the college I went to, Glasgow, oh, geez, it's called so many different things. Glasgow's, so, yeah, Glasgow College is what it's called now, but it was called something else when I went. CGC. They, nice. They also have a photography department, but I think, like Napier, it's much more the technical skills you need to photograph in a studio with a model or these kind of still life product yeah. shots, that kind of thing. The practical side of photography, I guess, if you want to call it that, rather than just, this is what I'm thinking about, this is what the work is about. Yeah. But, I mean, I'm sure both do, both sides of the coin, but to different degrees, Yeah. shall we say. Uh, since then, I've made a bunch of books and zines, had a couple of exhibitions. Still don't feel like I'm a successful photographer yet. Still, like still, still, still on the path, still on the road. Uh, and still trying to figure out, uh, I guess, what I want from both life and photography. And if I can, I don't know, make it my living, which I'm not sure I ever will, but it's trying. Very half heartedly, but, <laughs> but trying. Do you, out of interest, do you think? The making a living out of photography and actually making like financial income from it is an, an important factor for you. Is that something that you've kind of always aspired to do eventually, or would that be like a lovely kind of thing that might happen? Yeah, I mean, I feel like it's an unachievable dream for a lot of people. Probably for me as well. Although I do, at least my current situation, I'm lucky that I can live very cheaply. Uh, so I feel like it's achievable, but I don't know whether I have the drive or the motivation to really make it happen, if I'm, if I'm, <laughs> if I'm being honest. It requires a lot of dedication and a lot of you know, effort that I don't know that I really have within me. I'm a very, <laughs> I don't know, it takes a lot to get me motivated for things, I guess, so we'll see. In that future though uh, or in that kind of dream dream. what actually how because this is something that baffles me still really is how people actually do make money from photography mm. because everyone can take pictures now it's not like you can just have a little studio and do portraits on the side kind of thing like you say, you do have to be really on it like mm. to make your full yeah. living from it. And so I'm just in, always intrigued when people talk about the unattainable dream, what that would actually look like if you attained it. Well, how would you, where do you think the money well, is? Well, I feel like you have to have a lot of different streams of income, whether it's print sales plus book sales plus commercial work. I think it would need to be like a combination of all that and then some money from maybe like funding or whatever or grants, stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, I think that's not achievable for most people. I mean, the commercial side, I think most people could probably become a, a reasonably successful commercial photographer in terms of even like weddings and stuff like that. It depends. Uh, for us, in terms of like making a living from the art side of things, I think it's very difficult and possibly impossible in Scotland, to be quite frank. Maybe in bigger countries, or maybe just having, I suppose the internet makes everything open and accessible to everybody now, but... But also kind of free. Yeah, that's also <laughs> true, yeah. But I mean, in terms of getting in touch with people who might want to buy your work, but I don't know, it doesn't feel like there's a big enough scene or demand for it in Scotland that it would be possible. 
I think there is a demand, but I think there's not a big enough paying audience for that to ever be mm. like an, an industry that is, you know, a sustainable kind of industry where people. Yeah, and I feel we definitely underappreciate or maybe just don't really recognize photographers as artists in the UK. Maybe it's the same in other countries, but I feel like in America, certainly there's a more of a, a receptive audience or more of just a general group of people that are willing to look at photography even in a gallery whereas in the UK it's very difficult to find any photography in a gallery that's not dedicated to but I don't know if that culture will I'm trying to change it but it's like <laughs> making cheap books that everybody can afford but you know it's a very niche market right now I once the American thing is interesting I once met a guy at an Airbnb that I was staying in who was an artist from America, and I was like, oh, I'm kind of an artist from Scotland, <laughs> from <laughs> the UK, and um, like, how do you make your money? And he was like, oh, you know, I just sell paintings to restaurants, and I was like, oh, wow, amazing, like, how many do you sell? And he was like, well, like, I sold one last month for, like, $2,000, and I was like, okay, <laughs> amazing, yeah, like, so, like, this is why I'm on holiday now, and I was like... <laughs> Yeah, imagine that, that life but yeah. like, apparently they've bought 10 of his paintings so that's like what 20 grand just from them yeah, yeah, blew my nice. mind that's just something that I would never I'd never even have the balls mm. to go in somewhere and like do you want to pay 2 grand for this massive photograph <laughs> but then there's also this whole thing with I mean I shoot entirely digital now apart from instant film which I shoot sometimes but digital photographs are you can print as many as you want and it looks exactly the same as the one you just printed before. So, well, yes. I mean, they, they look the same. For all intents and purposes, you would never be able to tell the difference. Mm -hmm. So, and I really don't know how I feel about this whole auditioning thing where people, you know, have a limited edition of 10 prints of this size and charge much more because it's limited. Well, it's to try and add value to something that yeah, essentially that is has reproduce no, reproducible, yeah, has you know. Yeah, almost no value. So, I don't really know how I feel about this whole mm. thing. And the whole point, the whole thing, which is never going to make me any money, but the whole thing I have with <laughs> photography is that I want it to be accessible to everybody. I want yeah, no, anyone, that's, that's the killer. Yeah, <laughs> which, is, yeah, which is going to prevent me from ever yeah. making a living. But I want anyone who wants to look at my pictures to be able to afford to see them. Which yeah, doesn't, but doesn't then you need that rich... That one rich customer <laughs> you know, that you can one judge, like, you can exactly. take all the limited edition prints. Yeah, it's tricky. Yeah, because I, I mean, it's difficult for me to, lots of the books I would love to see, I can't afford, and I'll never be able to afford, and it's just how things are. I mean, it, some of that is because they're out of print or they came out in the 70s or 80s and I don't, you know, it's difficult to get. But even now, like, photo books come out and they're like 50, 40 quid, and it's like, I can't, I mean, I can afford it, but... I really want to spend 50 quid in the book there. Yeah. You know, that's a lot of money. So, I don't know, it's, yeah, the money side of things is probably not the best person to talk about. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not very, not, I uh, don't have a good business mind, I don't think. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, would you mind, for anyone listening that wants to make photo books, can't think of anything better, but has no idea where to start and how to finance it and how it all works. Do you have any advice or any insight into the process? Well, I started making very cheap zines that were just photocopied and stapled together. And I feel like that is a good place to start. But I got tired of that quite quickly, just because they're very... quite limited with what you can do and what you can achieve I guess but it's a good place to start and then I started looking up companies I used a company in Glasgow first to look for local companies I guess printers that can do perfect bound paperback books for reasonably cheap prices uh, but it depends how ambitious you are I'm not very ambitious so my runs are normally about maximum I've ever printed of one book is a hundred copies so to me that's ambitious yeah. That's twice my maximum. And it <laughs> took, I still have copies of, I've printed, I've self-published four books and I still have copies of two of them and probably might have them for the rest of my life. That's just how it goes. Some of them are popular, some of them just aren't. 
I'm guessing the one. one yeah, the one naked one. Got. <laughs> I was gonna say I'm guessing one of the ones you've got left is the one that you have a hundred of. Uh, I printed oh, no. A, no, I printed a hundred of three of those. Okay. The second, okay. the second book I've sold out. The naked one and the New York one. I still have copies left. They were both hundred copies. Uh, and yeah, I might have them forever. But that's just how it goes. That's nice. Yeah, I mean, it's, well, <laughs> it's nice to have you know one forever. Always, Actually, always, always keep one of your books as well. That's an important. That's that is a good point. And yeah, I need at least to one. Think about that. But I actually saw someone on the way here who was asking me what I was up to, and I was like, I'm going to go and talk to Dave. And I was like, You've met Dave, and he was like. Oh, the naked one. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the one. So, you can, you you can know, tell you me can, that it's after we're after we're off here. If you've got some left, sorry. No, that's fine. Carry on. Uh, what were we talking about? Books. Uh, you started off photocopying. Oh, yeah, and then, and then you moved quite quickly to. Yeah, about. but it depends how ambitious you are and how. The difficult thing is make, getting them made for a reasonable price and reasonable quality isn't difficult. What what is a reasonable price to you? Just for people well, who have no idea. Roughly four to six pounds per copy is what I okay. pay to get them printed. And I sell them for ten quid. But the colour one is probably gonna be six quid and I'll sell it for twelve maybe. Uh, this is another thing, no one ever talks about the numbers and I don't care. I'm happy to talk about how much things cost me. I'm a big fan of talking about costs. And I sell them through usually I sell them through Good Press and Street Level in Glasgow. And they take a percentage of the sale. The sale. Does good? Do they both? Yes, I think it's. I think they're both thirty-five percent, but I could be wrong. You need to check. It's thirty, I think. Okay. Uh, and obviously, if you take thirty percent away from ten pounds, that leave you with seven quid. So I make like three to two or three to one pounds per copy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't do it to make money, and I kind of accepted that I probably will never make like enough money to matter from full books if you sell 100 you made 300 quid yeah but you know the amount of time the amount of time you, 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 you put in to yeah. make it and also the amount of time that it takes to sell 100 it's really not worth it to I mean I don't do it for that so it's fine uh, I break even I think as long as you aim to break even that's pretty important you shouldn't do things at a loss unless you really are passionate about it and love it but I wouldn't do it if it was going to cost me money. Uh, but breaking even is fine, and I don't know. It gives me a chance to get my photos out there and also make something that I'm proud of and happy with, and that I enjoy making, which is the main thing for me. If I didn't enjoy doing it, I wouldn't do it. I just stop. But I really love. I guess I love taking photographs, but I also love the bookmaking process, although it's very different and very labor intensive and very time consuming and very like not much fun. That sounds weird that I enjoy even though it's not much fun, but like Wow, you're making it <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, like no one enjoys like sitting on the computer doing layouts and thinking Oh, is this photo in the right place? Is that one in the right if place? If you feel like you're onto a good thing, yeah, I, I mean, think you it, know, you and know that gives you a buzz. At the end, it's going to be good. It just takes a lot of annoying work together. Uh, but yeah, I don't self-publishing in general. I don't think there's much money, if any. To, I mean, there's some money to be made if you get really successful or you have a big following already. But I don't think you can make that much money from it. And that's probably why publishers in general, although it's not self-publishing, publishers in general are less willing to publish photo books now unless they know it's going to sell or unless the photographer pays them five to ten grand to get their book made with them. So yeah, uh, the numbers side is a bit, yeah, it's kind of shit, but that's just how things are. No, but it's not all complete darkness. <laughs> there, there is potential for profit. It's yeah. just about managing expectations. That's true. Trying I, to cut costs where you can without sacrificing something you really yeah, care about. Yeah, I feel like I've never, I've never done a Kickstarter. And I feel like that is... It can be a good way to make a book and get it produced and sell a few 
but it's also a huge amount of work to run a successful Kickstarter campaign, much more work than you think it's going to be. I mean, I've never done it or never tried, but I know how much work goes into it. But yeah, yeah. if you have any questions about making a book or want to buy one, then email me. I mean, the second part's unlikely, but you never know. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I think you say that, but you've sold out a run of 100 previously, that's so true. you should give yourself credit. 100 people bought that. Yeah, that's true. That 100 good... people. <laughs> Imagine if they were all in this room right now. That's true. When I was younger, I thought there was like a right and wrong. There were like right things to do in photography. Like you should have a clear idea of what they want. You want the project to be about before you start, and you should, you know, know all your technical aspect before you start everything that might happen. But really, it's just about what you want. Just do what you want to do. And if, I mean, you know, everybody makes shit work. <laughs> so you're going to make a lot of shit work but eventually <laughs> if you stick with it you, you might not <laughs> you might end up you know, learning from your shit work yeah. and make some good work and even the work that you think is shit work someone else might think is shit hot like yeah, that's the thing as well that's true yeah but I mean I think there's also objectively shit work where, well <laughs> I mean I make it all the time I make loads of shit pictures and you just look at it and you know move on for me I think it took a long time to realise that the whole point of taking pictures and putting them together in some format, whether it's book or on a website or in a piece of paper or in a series of framed work, whatever, the whole point of that for me is to try and communicate something. Mm. And so how I view if something successful or not is whether someone finds it valuable in some way and also whether they it's communicating what I want it to. Um, mm. But it's, I think that's different for each person as well. Um, but they very much it's just all about trying to basically start a discussion about something or communicate an idea mm. and um, that varies for each photographer like some people just want to make really technically beautiful pictures of you know food or like of mm. shoes or whatever yeah some people want to try and use pictures to make things easier to talk about I don't know it's yeah I mean I'm very uninterested in the technical side as long as it looks the picture looks good to me, I really don't give a shit about how it was achieved. But I don't know that I would say I'm trying to communicate with my work. I think it's more, I want something that's interesting to look at, but also that shows something that's important to me, I guess, or that I find worth thinking about I guess like a valuable observation yeah or like uh, even if it's like the bro the body of work as a whole is like uh, I don't really want to say anything explicitly it's more like making people I don't know think about the things that are in the pictures I guess or think about like it's difficult to this is why I take pictures and don't talk, don't talk about it. <laughs> See, I would say that that's communication. You're yeah, trying to well, communicate something. You're not telling them exactly a, a phrase or whatever, hmm. but you're basically pointing a massive finger at something yeah, and yeah. being like, look at that and think about it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is communication. Yeah, you're, I suppose. You're, trying to, you're observing and you're trying to point other people to make some conclusion. Yeah, you? and it's... Although I try to make pictures that I mean you can call them beautiful or good or interesting whatever you want to call them it's not purely about that either but that is like you you try to use like or I try to use like a collection of interesting pictures to hopefully say something more as a whole but maybe it doesn't always succeed maybe it's just a bunch of pictures that look nice and there's nothing <laughs> more than that which you know I hope not, but maybe that's... It depends on the person, I guess. There's a strong chance that I'm going to cut that before you start down talking. <laughs> <laughs> you should leave this part and leave the part where you're talking about cutting it. No censorship, you know. Gotta leave well, it off. No authenticity. <laughs> um, currently, how I'm running this podcast is I'm approaching people whose work I'm aware of and interested in that I've met through Fresh Focus, um, which is the critique group that me and Dave are both part of that operates through stills. Um, I was just wondering if 
it might be nice for you to just talk a bit about how you think that, that has either helped or really hindered your <laughs> creative process and uh, about whether you do have any whether you give any value to the critical uh, having a critical community I mean you know all of this because you've You've seen my entire Fresh Focus journey, <laughs> uh, but before I joined Fresh Focus, I really never had any, either had my work critiqued or critiqued other people's work in general, in person, or not really online either. Uh, so for me, it was like a very valuable, but also very new and quite tough learning experience, especially the first crit, which wasn't great, but it you know, it helped me out and got me to more where I needed to be, I guess. Not just for my personal work, but also helped me think about how I view other people's work and how I would uh, give people critical, I don't want to say advice, but feedback about their own work. Because when I first started, I really didn't know, I was pretty terrible, didn't really know what how to help people improve, which is the idea of a quick group, is to help people make their work better. Or better is a, not an ideal word. Improve on their work. Develop. But yeah, that's, there we go. It's a better word for it. Uh, and yeah, because I didn't study photography or art at an institution, I really hadn't had any kind of structured feedback like that before, which was definitely very helpful. What was it about the first one that was hard, that you found difficult? Was I it just... I think it's just the first time I'm hearing people rip into your work. I mean, not that it was that harsh, but it was, you know, uh, it was more negative than positive, put it that way. But it, you know, some people need that sometimes. Uh, and that was the first time I'd really heard people, had people give that to me. I mean, it, you know what it's like, it's difficult when you've spent a long time on something and you love it quite a lot and then someone just doesn't really like it and tells you why and you can't really argue with it and you're like, yeah, that's quite fair. <laughs> uh, but that is the hardest form of love. <laughs> <laughs> and I am a strong believer in that. Yeah, I mean, it's not the... Well, it, it's the uh, to me, that is the greatest respect for someone is hmm. telling them genuinely why you don't think something is yeah. working. Lots of places have camera clubs. I don't know what they're like in other countries. In the UK, they're very stuffy and old men who just want to talk about telephoto lenses and that kind of shit, or what kind of developer to use, shit like that, where it's not interesting for most people. Maybe interesting for you, but it's not for me. So, yeah, I don't know, it's a difficult one. I mean, if I didn't come across Fresh Focus, I probably wouldn't have developed a critique group or a peer group of people that could critique my work, which is a shame, but I don't really know how I would have got around that, to be honest. Do you think that in some ways you could describe Instagram as an online critique group? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. I don't, uh, maybe it's just because I don't have any followers and I'm shit at Instagram, but I don't... <laughs> I don't put a lot of faith in... I mean, I think it's a nice tool to share images of a certain type, but I don't think it's a very serious or... Even the way it displays photographs isn't particularly pleasing or effective. There was a time, a golden age of Instagram, where people would... I mean, not me, but <laughs> other people with more followers would get jobs based on their Instagram. When was this golden time? Like, <laughs> <laughs> apparently not you either. <laughs> I think like three or four years ago it was more like widespread, that kind of thing. But I don't think that exists. I think there's too many people on it now. With, and there's a lot of great work on there, but it's almost like too much great work. Where it's like, it can be quite disheartening to look at it and just be like, why the fuck am I taking pictures when there's a thousand people on here that are already taking much better pictures than I am? I mean, it could be disheartening, maybe, but it could also be totally kind of invigorating and empowering to yeah. know that literally anyone can 
can take pictures and share pictures now. You don't have to have an exhibition. You can just bash stuff on your gallery online. Yeah, that's true. And get people to look at them. It's I think work can be done to, to, to kind of develop how people uh, read the pictures on Instagram and engage with them because it does just become a thumb scrolling frenzy mm. of not taking anything in. But I think that actually the opportunity to see so many pictures from so many people, if you carefully curate, you know, who you're following, is actually total privilege, personal. Yeah, I mean, it, um, we're definitely living at a point where it's easier now to get your work seen than ever before. But it also makes it very difficult for people that matter, if you want to... That doesn't... That sounds terrible. <laughs> Cut that bit out. <laughs> People that you want to see your work, let's put it that way, to see your work because there's so much work yeah, out there that it's almost impossible to find someone. Recently I've been meeting more photographers that I would consider to be successful and they're just like everybody else. Just normal people that would, most of them are up for a chat if you just send them a message. Uh, I'm up for a chat if you just send me a message, as long as you're buying the first pint. Just joking. Uh, <laughs> But it seems like... He's not joking. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like... Uh, when you see people online, it feels like they're very successful and very cut off from yeah, where I, you are. Yeah, I agree. But, but it's... Actually, they're quite accessible if you just reach out. Mm -hmm. I feel like I've chatted a lot of shit, but... I feel like everyone does whenever they talk <laughs> for any length of time. Like not, I don't mean everyone does chat a lot of shit. I mean, everyone feels that way whenever they talk mm. about themselves and also talk about their own work for a long time um, I don't I didn't detect a lot of shit so don't worry um, good, good, good to know. thanks so much for listening if you did listen um, this has been Finding Focus thanks also to Lawrence Turner for the lovely intro and outro music and I have to say, I think that the audio quality in this one was a wee bit better than before, so I'm not even going to apologise for the pub sound. Although I did notice there were a couple of times you can hear me crunching a crisp, so apologies for that. Um, do stay tuned and come back for the next episode where I'll be talking to Dave about his new book, The River Isn't Yellow in Winter. Thank you. Pardon me, just burped up. That was a fantastic <laughs> I don't know if it's just sounded great yeah, through the mic. Hopefully, didn't pick it up, but uh, really, that uh, might be the little jingle. <laughs>